Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Maryam al Abdullah, and today's lecture is going to be on orthodontic removable appliances. Our reference is going to be chapter 17 from An Introduction to Orthodontics, Simon Littlewood and Laura Mitchell. Today we're going to cover these topics definition, mode of action, indications, general design, active components, retentive components, and base plate. The next lecture, we're going to cover the rest of the headings. So by definition, removable appliances are those orthodontic appliances that are fabricated mainly from acryl and wire. That's it. So we have a piece of acryl and a wire framework connected together. Uh, it can be removed from the mouth by the clinician and by the patient. Most removable appliances are made for the upper arch, and this is why we call it upper removable appliances. The abbreviation URA, all capital letter, is commonly used. Sometimes in their cases, we use appliances, removable appliances in the lower arch, but most of the um, let's say general dentist work is uh, confined to the upper arch. So URA stands for upper removable appliances. So just to know what do we mean by removable appliances in terms of orthodontic appliances in general. Now there are two types of appliances. Appliances that are bonded and banded to the teeth. These are the fixed appliances and appliances that can be removed from the mouth by the clinician and the patient and these are the removable appliances. Removable appliances are two types, passive or active. Passive removable appliances like space maintainers and retainers. Retainers, those that we use after uh, active orthodontic uh, treatment. Active removable appliances, on the other hand, will produce tooth movement. If it produces growth modification, we call it functional appliances. Functional appliances. If it produces only tooth movement, it's mechanical appliances. Now, functional appliances are a total different category uh, that we don't include with removable appliances. So let's say uh, for the sake of uh, orthodontic appliances, it's better to say that we have fixed appliances removable appliances and functional appliances. Functional appliances have totally different mode of action, different indications, different everything, and they can be actually removable or fixed, okay? So we're just gonna focus on the mechanical appliances, retainers, space maintainers. Mode of action. To understand what I mean by mode of action, there are six different types of tooth movement. Tipping tooth movement, torquing tooth movement, rotation around the long axis of the tooth, bodily movement, which is translation movement, extrusion outside the socket, intrusion toward the socket. Okay. Now, tipping movement, where we move the crown of the tooth, measly or distally, and tipping movement of the crown, where we move the crown buccally or lingually, these two tipping movements are called simple tipping movements where it can, produce, it can be produced by the removable appliances. Extrusion can also be produced by removable appliances. Movement of root, whether root tipping mesodistally uh, or root torquing buccolingually cannot be produced by removable appliances. Rotation cannot be produced by removable appliances. Bodily movement is not possible. Intrusion is possible, but only the uh, specialist can use it uh, as the design should be uh, very specific and follow up must be uh, careful uh, as intrusion, if not properly, the appliance, if not properly designed, can cause root resorption or uncontrolled flaring of the tooth where it moves uncontrolled uh, in an uncontrolled way, buccally or lingually. Okay, so 
Removal appliances can can produce simple tipping movement of the crown mesodistally, simple tipping movement of the crown buccolingually, and extrusion. Extrusion could be passive or it could be active. Okay, so when we say mode of action of removal appliances, tipping movements. Tipping movement is produced when a single point of force acting on the tooth surface produce pressure. This pressure will move the crown this side, and this will be around a uh, fulcrum, 40% the root length from the apex, down the apex, about 40%. This is the, the center of rotation. Okay, so you apply a force, and then the crown will move in the same direction by tipping movement. It's a single point contact. The removal appliances could also move blocks of teeth. Blocks of teeth still, the type of movement is simple tipping movement, but it's not for a single tooth, it's for group of teeth. Okay, block, blocks of teeth. For example, if you see here, the acryl is cut in the middle. We added expansion screw. If we open this expansion screw, both pieces of the acryl will be separated and this will push the buccal segment on the left side and on the right side buccally. Simple tipping movement of blocks of teeth. This is how it's done. Extrusion, or uh, as sometimes we call it, modify eruption and development of the occlusion. Okay, so here's an example, flat anterior bite plane. If you build the acryl behind the upper incisors to become thick and long, this will cause the lower incisors to bite on it in maximum intercuspation. And the buccal segment in the posterior will be separated. The lower teeth will be free to erupt, will be free to erupt. So this is resembling extrusion. And because it's it's a tooth movement that was produced without any direct force. We call it passive extrusion or modify the eruption of teeth. OK, so you put acryl here, the lower incisor bite on it, the posterior teeth are free to erupt, and this is what will cause extrusion of the lower posterior teeth. We could also build the acryl on the, on the occlusal surface of the posterior teeth in the upper arch. We call this posterior bite plane, or we call it buccal capping. Okay, what happens in maximum intercuspation is that the lower buccal teeth, the buccal segment will occlude and bite on this piece of the acryl, and this will inhibit eruption of the posterior segment, and this will modify occlusal development. Active extrusion, active extrusion is when you actually apply an attachment to, for example, an impacted tooth, and from the removal appliance, you, you add a force, you apply a force with an elastics, and this will push that tooth downward, which means extrusion. But this time it's not passive extrusion, it's active extrusion because you apply direct force on the tooth. Is this possible with removal? Yes, it is possible with removal appliances. So what are the indications for use for removable appliances? If the case needs simple tipping movement, to be corrected, if the malocclusion will need simple tipping movement to be corrected, then we use removable appliance. This is an example. The upper right central incisor is tipped palatally. So if we look at the line of the arch, the upper right central incisor is positioned more palatally. I want to push it buccally, labially, with a simple tipping movement. So it's possible to fit removal appliance and push that tooth across the bite to correct this anterior cross bite. If the malocclusion could be corrected by moving blocks of teeth with simple tipping movement, then we can use removable appliances. So this is an example that we explained. This is an, a, a removable appliance where the acryl is, uh, sorry, is, uh, has been cut in the middle. This is an expansion screw, and this is after expansion. So this is after expansion. You can see that what happens is that both blocks of teeth will be pushed apart, will be pushed apart, and this will produce symbol tipping movement. If I want to correct 
a deep overbite in a growing child, deep overbite in a growing child, then it is possible to use flat anterior bite plane to free the buccal segment and allow passive extrusion of the posterior teeth, modify eruption of the posterior teeth. Okay, if the patient has increased vertical proportions and I want to control and inhibit further eruption of the posterior teeth, I can use flat anterior bite plane. Sometimes it's useful, the, the removal appliances are useful means of applying extra oral traction to segments of teeth to intrude and or distalize. What does that mean? Now, I want to explain what extra oral traction means. Extra oral traction means the use of extra oral appliances to produce a force and transmit this force from the extraoral environment to the intraoral environment and affect teeth and cause their movement. Okay. This uh, force could be directed backward, and this is the use of headgear. Headgear is an extraoral appliance that is supported by the head and or sometimes by the neck and or the neck. And as you can see, it is attached to an intraoral appliance. And as the patient is using it, we produce a force that is directed backward. That is directed backward. And this can, you, can cause uh, different uh, effects on teeth uh, and or uh, jaw. But this is a simple definition of what we mean by extra oral traction. On the other hand, face mask, or sometimes it is called reversed headgear, is an extra oral appliance that will produce an anteriorly directed force. An anteriorly directed force. So these elastics will be connected to an intraoral appliance to transmit extra oral forces intraorally. And these forces are, the, are directed forward in this direction, forward. So this one is, di is a force directed backward. And this one is a force directed forward to give totally different uh, effect intraorally. Okay. So uh, one type of appliances that can be used to transmit these extra oral forces intraorally are removable appliances. And as this example is shows, this is a headgear that is supported by the head and the neck. As you can see here, the force is directed backward, and it can and it can cause distalization. If it is directed backward and a little bit up, it can also cause intrusion of the teeth. Okay, not the removable appliance will produce intrusion and distalization, the extra oral appliance, but here the removable appliances will work as a mean to transmit forces from the extra oral appliance intraorally. So this is another indication. Uh, space maintainers, for example, this case here, the patient had uh, loss of the E, and I want to maintain the space until the five fully erupts, so we can design a removable appliance that would sit around the teeth passively to allow the five to erupt in place. So this, is a, this is a space maintainer. Or we can use it as a retainer. So after we finish active orthodontic treatment, we can use removable appliances as a retainer to maintain the teeth position and prevent relapse. Uh, another indication is to use the removable appliance as an adjunct to fixed appliances uh, during comprehensive fixed appliance treatment. Sometimes we use this to test compliance, so we fit a first stage of removable appliance to do simple work to correct a simple feature of the malocclusion to test compliance, or if the patient is growing and the patient has uh, increased uh, uh, overbite like this patient here, this patient is presented with a classical class two division two malocclusion with deep overbite, where fitting a lower fixed appliance is not possible. As you can see here, there is no space to fit the lower fixed appliance. So what what we could do is is to apply to fit uh, an upper removable appliance with a flat anterior bite plane, so that the lower incisor will bite on this bite plane, and this will reduce the overbite. What happens to the posterior segment in the lower? 
it will be free to erupt. And meanwhile, we can fit fixed appliances in this case. Simple tipping movement to enhance bracket positioning. Sometimes the tooth is severely tipped and the fixed appliance is not uh, uh, possible to fit the bracket in the correct position. Um, so sometimes we can use removable appliances to tip the tooth back uh, to uh, modify its position. And then after that, we can fit the bracket as necessary. So what are the advantages of using removable appliances? Well, it can be removed for pressuring. This is very hand, uh, very um, useful for uh, oral hygiene. So you just remove it, you clean your teeth, and then you clean the appliance and put it back in again. Uh, increased anchorage with the palatal coverage. Uh, here, anchorage means resistance of unwanted tooth movement. Anchorage means resistance to unwanted tooth movement. So if you apply a force to the tooth to move it, this is the action. The reaction is that the rest of the teeth attached to the same appliance are going to react in the opposite direction. Now, in, in, for removal appliances, the acryl is, co is covering a vertical part of the uh, palate and the horizontal part of the palate, and that will give us a certain amount of anchorage, of resistance to unwanted tooth movement. It will help to distribute the forces, the reaction uh, of the active force. It will be distributed to a wider area. It's easy to adjust with the uh, loop forming player or, or Adam's player. It's easy to adjust. In growing child, the removal appliances are very useful in reducing the overbite. Uh, we can modify the acryl and use flat anterior bite plane or posterior bite plane like buckle capping, and this could be really useful. Can work as passive retainer or space maintainers, and it can transmit forces to blocks of teeth, not only a single tooth, and it has less risk of iatrogenic damage compared to the fixed appliances. Iatrogenic damage, like for example, root resorption, decalcification. Uh, so uh, using removal appliances will have less risk uh, compared to the fixed appliances. On the other hand, the removable appliances can be left outside the mouth, and this can produce more incidence of breakages and gloss. And it is totally based on patient. It relies a lot on patient's compliance. The patient doesn't want to wear it. The appliance is not inside the mouth. The tooth will not move, or the teeth will not move. Only tilting movement is possible. Only simple tipping movement is possible for a single tooth or for blocks of teeth. So uh, nothing fancy can be produced. No rotations, no bodily movements, no 3D control of tooth movement. Just simple tipping movement. Uh, it will need good technician, good technician skills uh, to, to get a good removal appliance so that it can work properly. It can affect speech because it covers the palate. It covers the palate and the patient will need some time to get used to it. Intermaxillary traction is not possible. This means to use forces from the opposite arch. Like, for example, in, in cases of fixed appliance, you can use some elastics where you connect some hooks in the lower arch with some hooks in the upper arch. It's possible, but the removal appliances, if you try to put some traction from the lower to the upper, this will cause the appliance to be dislocated, to be, to, to be removed from the mouth. It will reduce retention, so it's not possible to use intermaxillary traction. It's difficult to tolerate the lower removable appliances. <clears throat> it's difficult, so this is why most of the removal appliances are used in the upper arch. Uh, it's inefficient for moving multiple individual teeth. It can use to move a single tooth, few teeth or blocks of teeth, but multiple individual teeth is not possible. It's not possible. You will need multiple stages of removal appliances and this is not practical. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of removable appliances. Now, this is a very important note related to extraction. As a general rule, extraction should be deferred until after the appliance is fitted. If extraction, of course, we're not talking about, we are not talking about deciduous appliances, uh, deciduous teeth. If a deciduous tooth is loose, 
then extract and then continue taking records and continue fitting the appliance. We're talking about permanent teeth, okay? Permanent teeth. If extraction is part of the treatment, then do not extract the permanent tooth until you fit the appliance. Why? Number one, because if you extract and then send the, uh, the impression to the technician and the patient comes back one, two, three weeks later, what happens is that sometimes teeth will move around the uh, extracted area, okay? Number two, sometimes you fit the appliance and then the patient will realize that he cannot, he cannot wear this appliance. He cannot stand it. So if it, it's too late, you already extracted the tooth. So it's important to make sure that the patient actually accepts the appliance and comply with this treatment first, and then you can actually go ahead with extraction. Uh, it's also important to take the impression before extraction send it to the lab and then ask the technician to extract that tooth on the study model and fabricate the acryl and the rest of the uh, wire framework taking into consideration that this tooth will be extracted will be lost it's not part of the model right the basic principle of the design of removal appliances are four main components four main com components arab components active components retentive components, anchorage, and base plate. It's extremely important to understand that the appliance design is never the technician job. It's your job as a clinician. The design should be simple to insert and manipulate by the patient. It should achieve occlusal aims of the treatment, and it should not be complicated. Some of the components will contribute to more than one function. Now, the active components actually fits into three main categories, springs, screws, elastics. For the springs, these are the most commonly used active components and removable appliances. They are inexpensive, easy to fabricate, you don't need to buy special uh, components, you don't need special, uh, extra special skills, okay? Uh, and the uh, amount of force it produces on the tooth will follow this formula, okay? The force will depend on the amount of deflection. D is the amount of deflection, uh, the amount of activation of the wire. R is the radius, the thickness of the wire. So as you can see, the thicker the wire, the more force will be applied to the tooth. If you multiply the thickness by two, if you doubled the thickness and the radius of the wire, what happens is that you will get a, multi a force multiplied by 16, because this is R to the power of four. L downstairs here is the length of the wire. As you increase the length, the force will be reduced. The wire will be more flexible and you will have a lighter force. So the force will be reduced. So if you double the length of the spring, what happens is that the force will reduce to the power of uh, eight, I think, to, to the power of eight. Right. Uh, now, the length of the spring is limited to the size of the arch and the depth of the sulcus, of course. And you can control the length and you can increase it by incorporating um, uh, coils. The more number of coils you incorporate, the longer the wire is, and this will reduce the amount of force delivered to the tooth. So you can control the length by controlling its uh, its design. You can add loops, you can add coils to increase the length of the wire. A spring with a coil, a spring with a coil is more efficiently working if it moves a tooth as it unwinds, as it unwinds. So for example, this is a buccal canine retractor. Its job is to distalize the canine, distalize the canine. So the tooth movement is in this direction, right? This direction, distally. And this is not in the same direction as this coil unwinds, that the coil will unwind measly. So this is not as efficient as this one down here. This is a. Uh, the finger spring, 
The little finger spring has an active arm, as you can see here. So this is the anterior part of the appliance. This is the posterior part of the appliance, and this is the active arm. Its job is to distalize the canine as well. So the direction of tooth movement is distally, this way. And this is in the same direction of unwinding this coil. This coil will, will unwind as the tooth will move. So this is more efficient in this terms, in this, uh, based on this concept. As a general rule, active components should be fabricated from 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire. 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire. There are some exceptions, and it's important that if you use this diameter, you should protect you should protect the wire because this is a small diameter that is prone and liable to distortion and breakages. How can we protect the wire? There are two ways to do it. The first one is we call sleeving or tubing or sheeting, okay? Uh, as you can see here, this is the Pulcanine retractor. This is the active arm. On the other hand, this is the retentive arm. You can notice that the retentive arm looks thicker than the active arm, although this is the same wire. What happened is that this is fabricated from 0.5 millimeter. How do I know that? Because the technician used tubing, or so you can see the beginning of the tubing, tubing or sleeving to the retentive arm to strengthen the wire and to reduce distortion and breakages uh, uh, for the wire. So you can see this is tubing or sleeving, and this is made of 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire. Here, this is a little finger spring, and the thickness of the wire is the same all around. So how can we protect it? As you can see down here, we have boxing of acryl down, touching the active arm, and the retentive arm is embedded inside the acryl. So this is a protecting by boxing or by building acryl around it, okay, protected by the acryl. So this is another way to do it. Um, a spring made of 0.5 millimeter in diameter will give, uh, if activated by three millimeters, will give the same force as a 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire activated by one millimeter, okay? Because the thicker the wire, the heavier the force. The point of application of the force must be as close as possible to the center of resistance to reduce the uncontrolled rotation, to produce the wanted tooth movement with minimal side effects. Okay, so the point of application of the force should be as close as possible to the center of resistance. The type of springs we're going to talk about are Z-spring. This is the Z-spring or double cantilever. This is the T-spring. This is the little finger spring. Buckle canine retractor. Roberts retractor. And labial bow. Now, from our chapter from uh, the uh, Laura Mitchell and Simon Littlewood, you will not find lots of details on springs. Okay, so I want you to stick to the notes from this lecture and if you want to read more you can go to the handbook of orthodontics a coburn and dbas to read further about these components z spring is an active component that is indicated to push a single tooth in the anterior segment labially so to start off with you need a tooth that is tipped buccally out, sorry, palatally, outside the line of the arch, sometimes in crossbite, and you want to correct this crossbite by pushing that tooth back labially. If you want this, then Z-spring is the indicated active component. It can also move to adjacent teeth, so you can make the, the Z-spring a little bit wider, and then we call it double cantilever, and you need to modify it accordingly. For example, this, uh, case here down here you have both lateral incisors are positioned platally if you want to correct their position and you want to correct the cross bite on both of them then you have to have a z-spring on this tooth and another z-spring on the other tooth so we can use it on multiple non-adjacent anterior teeth or if adjacent then you can use it then on two not more than that two now the thickness of the wire should be 0.5 millimeters stainless steel wire for a single tooth, if you want to use it for two adjacent teeth, then it is equal to 
six millimeter stainless steel wire. This component, uh, if made of 0.5, it should be protected by the acryl. We don't leave it, we uh, protect it by the acryl. And you should have good retention of the appliance anteriorly to avoid displacement of the appliance as you activate the spring. Usually the activation is one to two millimeters by opening the coil. The mode of activation is by opening the coil and then you squeeze it back uh, behind the tooth. And as it unwinds, it will push that tooth labially. So this is efficient. This is efficient like the belated finger spring because it moves the tooth as it unwinds. The activation is by pulling the uh, active arm 45 degrees away from the fitting surface away from the fitting surface. So this is how you do it. This is the fitting surface. Okay, you use a belated, uh, sorry, loop forming player, or you can use um, uh, Adam's clasp, Adam's player, and then you can actually pull the active arm away from the fitting surface, 45 degrees, one to two millimeters. So this is the Z-spring, is used to push at the upper left central labially. This is another example of the spring that is used to push the upper left lateral labially. As we said, if there are two adjacent teeth, then we can use double cantilever. It's made of 0.6 millimeter stainless steel wire. Now 0.7 is a bit heavy unless you have two big central incisors, like nine millimeter in diameter, okay? In this case, you need a longer uh, wire and you need to have a thicker wire to uh, counteract the effect of reducing uh, the force by increasing the length, okay? Anyway, the Z-spring should be, the active arm should be uh, equal in the mesodistal dimension to the mesodistal uh, dimension of the tooth that you want to push. I'll just go back one uh, slide. So this is the active arm. The active arm should be long enough uh, equal to the mesodistal width of the uh, tooth that you want to move. We have one coil, two coil, and then the retentive arm. Okay, again, active arm, two coils, and then retentive arm. These are the main components. And the active arm should be long. Uh, its, its length should be equal to the mesodistal width of the tooth that you want to move. Okay, if two teeth, then the active arm should be, uh, the length should be equal to the mesodistal width of both teeth that you want to move. T spring is used to push a tooth in the posterior segment buccally. For example, premolar, a molar, so you can use it to push a tooth buccally. Okay, so the same as Z spring, but it has different design. This is the active arm, and then we have uh, the retentive arm, and in between we have number of coils. It could be one pair of coil or loops, and we can have two pair of loops according to the uh, range of movement that we want to produce for that tooth. The longer, the bigger the range of movements, the more pair of, of loops we need to add to give more flexibility and more range of action. It should be fabricated from 0.5 millimeter stand steel wire, okay? Unless you want to move a multi-rooted molar, a multi-rooted molar, a 0.5 is a bit too thin for that uh, tooth, so you can use 0.6 millimeter stainless steel wire. Okay, so as a general rule, active components uh, components should be 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire, unless you have a certain exception. The exception here, if you have multi-rooted tooth, that means you need bigger force. Bigger force that means you need a thicker wire. Uh, so 0.6 millimeter could be used to move a molar. Okay, if it's a canine, if it's a premolar, then you can use T-spring. The T-spring is, if 0.5, then it's protected by the acryl. It's protected by the acryl, and the activation is the same as the Z-spring. 45 degrees away from the fitting surface, you just need to hold the active arm and pull it away from the fitting surface, one to two millimeters. Okay. Palatal finger spring. When is this uh, component indicated, it is indicated if you want to move a tooth within the line of the arch, mesially or distally. If you want to move a tooth within the line of the arch, mesially or distally. Okay, then the later finger spring is uh, your active component of choice. 
Now, as a general rule, any tooth you want to tip using removable appliances, it, for example, if you want to move a tooth mesially, then the tooth should be to start off with upright or distally angulated. If you want to move a tooth distally, then the tooth should be upright or mesially angulated. Otherwise, you cannot tip it with simple removable appliance. You have to choose something else. Okay. So this is the palatal finger spring. It is used mainly to move a tooth mesially or distally within the line of the arch. The thickness of the wire is 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire, unless you want to distalize or to move a molar, a multi-rooted tooth. If you want to use palatal finger spring on a molar, then you have to increase the thickness to 0.6 millimeter stainless steel wire. The wave activation is by opening the coil, open activation, okay? The same as Z spring, the same as T spring, palatal finger spring is activated by opening the coil. You open the coil and this will produce distalization here, for example, distalization of the canine. Okay. Uh, the spring should be positioned at right angle to the plant tooth movement. The coil should be halfway the intended movement distance. So this is the coil. This is how much I want to move. This The whole uh, free area in the acryl is where I want to move the tooth from this point to this point. The coil should be halfway this uh, halfway the intended moving distance. It can be activated, as we said, by opening the coil. So as you fit the appliance halfway, this is the active arm of the palatal finger spring. It comes in contact with the tip. And then as you further fit the appliance, it should slide mesially until it comes in contact with the contact point or a little bit below the contact point. So if you look at this palatal finger spring, we are trying to move this tooth distally. We're trying to move this tooth distally, okay, distalizing the canine. So the main components, we have a coil, active arm, and then we have retentive arm. These are the main components of palatal finger spring. Coil, active arm, and then we have retentive arm, okay? This is protected by the uh, acryl. Buccal canine retractor, buccal canine retractor is indicated mainly to retract. When we say retract in the posterior segment, we mean to, to move them distally. So it is mainly used to distalize a tooth and or to push it palatally. Distalize and push palatally. Okay, so the main component is a coil, active arm, and the retentive arm. As you can see here, the difference between the active arm and the retentive arm in terms of thickness, this is a thicker wire because it's being sleeved. So if I ask you, what is the thickness of this wire? You should know that this is 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire because you need it to add sleeving or tubing to protect it, okay? And if I said, what's the indication for this one? It's mainly used to distalize the canine. But here, for example, looking at this design of the active arm, this is the active arm, this is the coil, and this is the retentive arm. If I ask you about the indication, you need to know that this is not only to distalize the canine, but because the active arm was extended labially, it is also used to push the canine palatally. Push the canine palatally. Here you cannot push the canine palatally. The, the, the active arm is not being modified and extended to touch the labial surface. So this is mainly to uh, distalize the canine. So basically, uh, if we ask about the thickness of the wire, you will find that this wire is 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire because the retentive arm is tubed. Okay. And this is to show you what the uh, what we mean by uh, initial alignment of the tooth. So, for example, this tooth here to start off with is tipped mesially. Is tipped mesially, and using this appliance, this component, I want to tip it further distally. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. But if it's already at the start tipped distally. You cannot, distal, you cannot further distally tip it. You cannot do this. This is not indicated. If this is the case, then you cannot use removable appliances. 
because this cannot be corrected by simple tipping movement. You need to add some uh, movement of the root, some bodily movement, and this cannot be achieved with removable appliances. So the tooth should be to start off with tipped on the other direction. So I want to distalize it, it should be mesially tipped. I want to mesialize it, it should be distally tipped, okay, to start off with. Uh, the activation of the buccal canine ret retractor is by closing the coil, closing the coil. Okay, so this is the coil, this is the active arm, and this is the retentive arm, and we close the coil to activate the uh, this active component. Robert's retractors, think about Robert's retractor as two buccal canine retractors connected anteriorly with the labial bow. This is the best way to look at Robert's retractors. It has a totally different indications than buccal canine retractor, but I'm, but I'm talking about the design, okay? And it is, as you can see, the thickness of the wire here for this one is 0.5. Why? Because you can see the difference of thickness and you can see the difference of the color of the retentive arm. This is the retentive arm, coil, active arm. On the other, other side, we have another coil and another retentive arm. Okay, so this is 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire. Robert's retractors are used to tip the labial segment palatally. When I say a retraction in the anterior segment, we mean to move them palatally, okay? And this can be only indicated in patients with class two division one incisors classification with increased overjet, proclined upper incisors and spaced upper labial segment. If this is not the case, then it's not indicated to use Robert's retract. You cannot retract anterior teeth using removable appliances if this is not the case. Again, you should have class two division one incisors classification, increased overjet, proclined upper incisors, and spaced upper labial segment. All the terminologies I used are already explained in your first lecture. Okay. If the labial segment is well aligned, you cannot use rubber retract. You cannot retract the upper labial segment. If the upper incisors are not proclined already in the in the correct uh, proclination, or they are upright, you cannot use uh, rubber retract. You need to use something else. If the, uh, for example, if the overjet is not increased, you cannot use rubber retract, and so on and so forth. So we know what the indication is. If you don't use tubing in any of the components that we talked about, then you should increase the thickness. You should use 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire. Okay. Robert's retractor is difficult to repair. It's not patient friendly components. You have to have the impression uh, reaching to the depth of the functional sulcus. Any distortion of the uh, design will cause ulcer, will cause discomfort. It's, uh, we don't use it that much uh, anymore, and it is activated by closing the coil, closing the coil. So this is just, just to show you how the uh, sheets are added. So this is a 0.5 millimeter steel wire for the Robert's retractor. The alternative is to use active labial bow. Active labial bow is the alternative to Robert's retractor. It's more patient friendly, easier to fabricate, easier to adjust and activate. It is made of 0.7 millimeter style steel wire, okay? And the classical labial bow extends from canine to canine. And the classical labial bow is mainly used for retention. But if you want to use it for uh, retraction of the upper labial segment, for palatal movement of the upper labial segment, then you need to modify it to give you lighter force, okay? So let's say, for example, this is from canine to canine. If the labial segment plus the canine are wide, that means your labial bow will be already long and that will give you lighter force anyway. But in the uh, conventional cases, it's better to increase the length by using what we call extended labial bow or long labial bow. A labial bow that does not extend from canine to canine extends from four to four. So this will give you extra length and this will make the force lighter, more appropriate for retraction of the upper labial segment. Or we can use a long labial bow extended from six to six all the way. We call it wrap around. We call it wrap around labial bow. Okay, so we can use this or this to increase the length. An alternative is what we call labial bow with reverse loop. 
So this is the labial bow. The conventional one should extend from three to four and then go forward. No, the labial bow with reverse loop, this retentive arm will extend backward, will go reverse direction and then come back forward again. OK, this is why we call it labial bow with reverse loop. The conventional loop goes from the canine forward. OK, from the canine retentive arm forward and then we have the active arm. But labial bow with reverse loop, it goes from the canine, uh, from the canine and the fore, and then instead of going forward, it will go backward and then up again, and then we have the active arm. Okay, the way of activation of the conventional labial bow is by closing the loop. But for the labial bow with reverse loops, if you want to activate it, you activate it by opening the loop. So if you open this part here, this will push the active arm backward, and this will produce uh, retraction of the upper labial segment. Okay, the wire is longer, it will give you uh, uh, lighter force and the activation is by opening, which is more efficient in, term, in terms of unwinding during tooth movement. So these are the main active components that we talked about. Z-spring, double cantilever, T-spring, palatal finger spring, buckle canine retractor, Robert's retractor and labial bow. You need to know the name of these components. You need to know the indications, thickness of the wire, and um, uh, any special uh, information about their design. Now, the screws, which is part of the active components, are incorporated into the uh, removable appliance to move blocks of teeth in a certain direction. The direction will depend on where you position your screw and how you cut the acryl. OK, the advantage of using this, these screws is that teeth being moved could be clasped for retention. So used when retention is limited. So the same block of teeth that you want to use, you can add retentive components. It's not contraindication. The disadvantage is that it's a kind of bulky, so you need to add lots of acryl and it's expensive because you buy a, a separate component and you add them to your uh, acryl and metal framework. You don't actually uh, fabricate it inside the lab. It, can, it should be activated by the patient by opening the screw uh, one turn. Every one turn, it, one turn means one quarter turn, turn, yeah, because you cannot turn it all the way. You can see these wires will prevent you from turning it one, one a whole way. So you turn it from here to here. This is one quarter turn. For example, twice a week, once a week, it depends on the case. Every turn will give you 0.25 millimeter. So this is an expansion screw before activation. And this is how these two parts are being pushed away. This is after activation. So this is an example where we have an expansion screw in the middle and you cut the acryl in the middle so that when the patient opens the Screw, what happens to these two pieces of the, the acryl is that they will be pushed apart. If they are being pushed apart, they will move the left buckle segment and the right buckle segment buckly in an equal way. Each quarter, one quarter turn is equal to 0.25 millimeter of expansion, my expansion screw. If you cut the acryl in the anterior segment and you put the screw in this direction, what happens is that this appliance will, will push the labial segment forward, OK? So if I tell you what's the result of activating this screw is to procline the upper labial segment. So this can be used in class three cases to correct the anterior cross -right. So this is after activation. You can see the this space made by pushing both parts of the acryl apart. This is um, a, a type of expansion screw we call it the three direction expansion screw you cut the wire in a y shape so you cut it from here there and then in the middle and as the patient activated what happens is that expansion in addition to uh, proclination of the upper labial segment so it is called three direction expansion screw so here for example the acryl is cut in this way if you activate the screw it will only push the Seven, six, five on the upper left quadrant buckley only because the rest of the acryl here will resist the unwanted tooth movement and it will not cause uh, or it will cause minimal 
movement of T. So if you can see, it's the same expansion screw, but the cut of the acryl is different. So the aim of the expansion is different. You only want to expand unilaterally, looking at these three teeth only. You want to push them buckly. So this is the difference between these two. It's the same screw, but this is cut in half, and this is cut uh, to, to locate only a small piece, or small blocks of teeth. The same here, this is uh, asymmetrical expansion where we have the right side. I want to expand the right side and I don't want to touch the left side because the transverse relationship is correct. So the way to do it is to cut the acryl so that we can isolate this part of the uh, dentition. And you can, when you expand this, you expect that only these teeth will be pushed buckly. Okay. So this is the this is the active unit and this is the anchorage unit to resist unwanted tooth movement. The result should be pushing a buccal segment in the upper right quadrant buccally. So again, we cut the acryl here. We change the position of the screw, not in this place, in this place. So if you activate it, what happens is that you push the seven, six, and five in the upper left quadrant distally. So you want to retract the upper left buccal segment, namely seven, six, and five in this quadrant. You want to push them distally. You want to distalize them. So this is the same screw, different cut of the acryl. The patient will activate it and it will push this uh, buccal. So again, uh, sorry, distally. So again, the screw will reduce the force, uh, sorry, will, will reduce the tooth movement that uh, relies on where you position the screw and where you cut the, the acryl. Okay, these are other examples. Anyway, elastics is the last active component. Elastics comes in different sizes, one eighth, three fourth inch, different forces, uh, different thicknesses. Okay, we can use these elastics by attaching them to certain hooks, for example, here. This is a hook near the canine and another one here. So you can you can instruct the patient to use these uh, elastics from the canine to the canine to retract the upper labial segment, to retract the upper labial segment palatally. Um, uh, they are less, less commonly used, to be honest, less commonly used. And uh, you need to be careful with the design of your appliance. Uh, you can use them if you have an impacted tooth and you want to produce active extrusion. Then you can have your removal appliance and a certain attachment bonded to the impacted tooth. And then you can have a hook and you can instruct the patient to put some elastics from that hook to the impacted, to the attachment on the impacted tooth. And then this will produce active extrusion. Another example, but the elastics are less commonly used. So here we finished the first part of the design, and that is the active components. Now we will come to the retentive components. The retentive components are used to help to retain the appliance in place and resist the displacement during active, due to active components or enduring function. As the patient speaks, eats, uh, they can be displaced. So uh, resisting their displacement is is mainly achieved by the retentive components. The effectiveness of the active components will very much rely on the retention of the appliance. If the appliance is not retentive, the patient will not use it and the active components will not be uh, effective. Now, as a general rule, we need three points of retention, one in the anterior segment and two in the posterior segment. But if, you, if your active component is an expansion screw, then it's important to have four points of retention because as you open the screw, this will go, it will give abrupt heavy force. Abrupt heavy force. So you need to have the appliance properly retentive inside the patient's mouth in order to be effective and in order to improve compliance of the patient. So we need it so that the active components could be efficient. They can be uh, positioned uh, properly in place. Um, uh, it's important to have it retentive the appliance so that uh, uh, it will not experience fatigue or failure as it comes out of the mouth frequently and it will improve patient's compliance. So this is important. 
The retentive components should be easy to fabricate and provide adequate retention of the appliance. It should have no interference with the occlusion and should not apply active force on the tooth. It should be passive, it should engage the undercut and provide retention only. It can be used on both fully and partially erupted teeth and can be used on permanent or deciduous teeth and it should not touch the soft tissue causing uh, trauma or ulcers. The main retentive components are Adam's clasp. This is the Adam's clasp. This is the south end clasp, ball ended clasps, C clasp, plant clasp and the conventional labial bow that we talked about. Adam's clasp is the most commonly used uh, retentive components in the posterior segment. Uh, it should be fabricated from 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire. Uh, by the way, as a general rule, retentive components should be fabricated from 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire, and there are some exceptions. Active components fabricated from 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire, and there are some exceptions. So this is the general rule. For Adam's clasp, we should use 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire unless you want to use it on premolars or deciduous molars. Okay, then you have to use 0.6 millimeter stainless steel wire. It's too heavy to use 0.7 on these teeth. The main component is one bridge two arrowheads engaging the undercut, two retentive arms or flyover arms, and then near the palatal surface, you have the tags, and this is the part that is incorporated in the acryl, okay? Uh, for kids, it should extend just below the gingival margin, but for adults, it should extend down the crown, even if you have a long crown. You just go with the undercut and that's it. You don't go all the way. The Adams clasp is simple, easy to construct, and no special instruments, no, it's not expensive. It can be used on any tooth. If you need retention, really, it can be used on any tooth, and it can be used for deciduous or permanent dentition. So one bridge, two arrowheads engaging the undercut, two flyover or retentive arms, and then we have tags, and it is built, uh, well, the acryl is built around it. Now, Adam's clasp, there are a number of modifications that could be uh, used with Adam's clasp. The first one is extra oral traction tube. So you can add, you can add extra oral traction to the tubes, tubes on the bridge so that you can use, uh, like we explained, headgear uh, where the face is inserted in this tube and then the headgear is attached to that face um, You can actually solder a labial bow. So this is a long or extended labial bow. We said labial bow classically goes from canine to canine, but sometimes we need to increase the length to uh, increase flexibility. So you can go from the bridge, you can soldier it from the bridge of the uh, Adams clasp from on one six to the bridge of the Adams clasp on the other six, right? Uh, or you can add other components. Uh, you can add a coil. To the bridge you can add a hook and this is a good attachment to apply other forces or elastics and you can modify it by having atoms with accessory accessory atoms so one atom on the six and another one on the uh, premolar for example the five so this is called uh, atoms with an accessory or double atoms as you can see here an atom that is engaging both six and five at the same time so this is what we call double atoms double atoms. You can adjust Adam's, play, uh, Adam's clasp from two points. Point number two will, uh, as you bend it with the Adam's player, will push the arrowheads further uh, vertically and mainly uh, towards the tooth to engage the undercut. If you activate it from number one, this will actually move it horizontally toward the tooth and will have minimal vertical effect of adjustment. So you hold, you support the appliance between your fingers and then you use Adam's clasp to adjust the retentive arm in order to allow the arrowhead to engage the undercut, okay? So this is how you adjust Adam's to be more retentive. South end is an anterior retentive component that uses the undercut in the labial uh, surface between the embrasures. So this is the 
uh, source of retention, the undercut between the teeth. Okay, it should follow nicely the line, the the gingival line. Okay, it should not come in touch with it. It will cause ulcer. So it it goes from it engages usually two anterior teeth, two adjacent anterior teeth. It could be a lateral and a central, central and a central, or a central and a lateral on the other side. Two adjacent teeth. It follows the gingival margin. It engages the undercut between the two incisors um, in the embrasure area. And then, relatively, you will have two retentive arms. It is fabricated from 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire. Okay, and you adjust it so that you bend it so that the uh, uh, this part, the arrowhead, engages the undercut between the incisors. All in the clasps um, will engage the undercut within the embrasure between teeth. You can have multiple ball in the clasps, and you can use them if you cannot use uh, other components. This is an alternative. It's, paint, it's made of 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire, and the ball. Uh, the ball end clasp usually fabricated with a silver soldier, or it can be ready-made, preformed. You can buy them. Plate clasp is made of 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire, and it is mainly used with tubes or bands on molars. It engages the undercut under the tube, so it is used when there is a band or a tube fitted on the molars, and it gets the undercut underneath the tubes. Labial bow is a classical retentive component in the anterior segment. It classically, it extends between the canine and the canine, and it, uh, it has one um, bow on each side, and then we have the, the, the active arm uh, surrounding the teeth. Okay, so this is the labial bow. And you can see that we have um, a Adam's uh, on the oh, other components, sorry, on the premolar area, uh, labial bow is mainly to get retention from the uh, upper labial segment, and it prevents buccal flaring. It prevents buccal flaring. We we forgot to talk when we talked about uh, south end. We forgot to say that this is contraindicated in patients with. Uh, uh, retroclined upper incisors because retroclined upper incisors will have no undercut, so it's useless. Or uh, proclined, um, uh, severely proclined upper incisors because we will have too much undercut and it will cause pain and discomfort and heavy force as the patient inserts the appliance and remove the appliance. Okay, so the upper incisor should have normal inclination or a little bit of proclination is acceptable. Okay, to activate the labial bow, you close the loop. To, be, to become more retentive. Now we have fitted labial bow. It's a modification of the traditional labial bow. Fitted labial bow is a labial bow that is being bent to follow the labial surface of the anterior teeth, and it's mainly used for retention, to retain the incisors after active orthodontic treatment and prevent relapse. We call this fitted labial bow or acrylic-faced labial bow. Acrylic face labial bow is where you use acryl to follow closely the labial surface of the upper labial segment of the upper incisors. So this is a fitted labial bow on the upper teeth, and this is an acrylic face labial bow on the lower teeth, and this is the classical labial bow without uh, being fitted or being uh, faced with acryl. Okay, as we said, there are modifications. We can have a long labial bow, or we can have short labial bow. If you, for example, have problems with the canine, severely buccally displaced, rotated, not erupted yet, then you can still use labial bow, but this time it's going to be short labial bow. So these are the main retentive components, the Adams clasp, south end, C clasp, bowl ended clasps, and splint clasp and labial bow. I think we're going to finish the rest uh, of the components in terms of base plate, anchorage, and the other subheadings in the next lecture. Um, thank you so much. And if you have uh, an interest to read further about this topic, you can actually go to Removal Orthodontic Appliances textbook by Isaacson. And as I said, you can go to Chapter 8 from Handbook of Orthodontics by Debeez and Coburn.